Good afternoon and good evening, everyone, at the third joint meeting of the Young Nephrologist Platform of the European Renal Association and the Young Nephrologist Committee of the Japanese Society of Nephrology. I'm uh, Oshoya Chatreka, the current um, chair of the ERA YNP. Uh, might I say on behalf of the ERA YNP that it is really a special gift to be here again. Warmly welcome to all attendees. So I don't want to waste your time with a long opening speech, but uh, let me kindly and succinctly give you an outline of this webinar and shortly present our panelists. So herein, I extend a warm welcome not only to all of our panelists, but uh, moreover, our council representatives of both societies. In the next couple of minutes, I'll present the panelists from the aero part. And after my talk, I will pass the word to Professor Motoko uh, Yanagita, Chair of the uh, Young Nephrologist Committee, uh, JSN, to present your representatives, uh, panelists, and lecturers delegated by JSN. So why is it a gift? Because it is the third time when we have the opportunity to meet and exchange our somewhat different and at some point uh, variable clinical and experimental knowledge on burning clinical and experimental questions uh, of uh, ADPKD and CKD MBD at this virtual platform. And also because it is a pleasure to meet at such a platform that is bringing our young nephrologist communities closer to each other, providing place for uh, networking uh, for future and for future communications. Uh, we feel privileged to have our representatives from the ERA Council. So first, Professor Christoph Benner from Germany, the current chair of the European Renal Association. Professor Benner is a senior professor of medicine in the Department of Clinical Studies and Epidemiology, University Hospital of Würzburg, and uh, a visiting professor of uh, renal medicine at the uh, Newfield um, Department of Population Health Clinical Trial Service Unit, University of Oxford. Uh, he will address his message uh, to the young nephrologist before the scientific discussion. Professor Werner have, uh, has uh, endorsed uh, this uh, initiative to be realized thus far, so a special thank for his dedication for the, uh, toward the young nephrologists. After the scientific section, it is our privilege uh, to welcome the uh, closing remarks of Professor Rosa Torre from Barcelona, a coordinator of hereditary kidney diseases uh, in, uh, at uh, Fondaccio Puigvert and a researcher in the nephrology group at the uh, San Paul Research Institute Barcelona, and who is the chair-elect of the European Renal Association. She will uh, share her thoughts and vision about the future after the scientific section. After the introduction remarks, uh, two sessions will be presented. The first topic will be ADPKD and the second one about novelties in dialysis. So I'm delighted to present shortly our lecturers who kindly accepted our invitation and joined us today. Uh, Maria Vanessa Perez Gomez, who is an accomplished uh, academic researcher from uh, Autonomous uh, University of Madrid, and uh, Luciano Pereira, adult nephrologist from uh, Portugal, who is an expert in renal osteodystrophy and will share his knowledge on CKD MBD in the dialysis patient today. So, a uh, more detailed introduction will be reported by uh, the chairs of the meeting, Safak Mirioglu, who uh, from uh, Turkey, who uh, is uh, actually the chair-elect of uh, Young Nephrologist Platform of ERA. So we are looking forward uh, to a very exciting discussion on both hot topics. So on behalf of the ERA YNP, I'm gratefully thanked to all who joined us today and uh, even to all who contributed to the realization of this event. Lastly, let me wish you a nice and uh, useful scientific discussion. So now I'm passing the word to the chair of uh, Jason YNP to share her opening remarks and introduce the representatives and presenters from the JSN part. So please, uh, Professor Yanagita. Okay, thank you, Osi, and uh, thank you for the audience for joining this symposium. Uh, my name is Motoko Yanagita from Kyoto University, Japan. I have to say that I am not the uh, representative or chair of the YNP in Japan, and I'm not young enough for that, but Jason kindly offered me a chance to do this, and uh, this will be the third joint symposium for young nephrologists from ERA and Jason. Uh, since the ERA and Jason signed an agreement in 2015, 
we held joint symposium at the annual meeting of JSN and sent ambassadors to ELA Congress continuously. Uh, such an effective relationship has borne fruit over the years, and the joint symposium on aging will be held in Kyoto in this September. Aging of the population will have a significant impact on renal disease care, and this is an important issue for both Europe and Japan. We would be, we would be delighted if you could join the symposium if you are interested in. Although there has been an effective relationship between the two societies for many years, I believe that to make this relationship sustainable, it is important to have exchanges not only between the senior generation, but also between the younger generation. In this sense, I believe that this symposium is extremely important. Uh, first, from JSN's side, Professor Naoki Kashihara, the immediate past president of JSN and the chair and professor at Kawasaki Medical School Hospital, will deliver a message to young nephrologists. Professor Kaoru Hayashi from Keio University will chair the symposium, and Dr. Masahiro Kurashige from GK University School of Medicine will give lectures on the genetic diagnosis and treatment of ADPKD in Japan. In addition, Dr. Shunsuke Yamada from Kyushu University will discuss advances in CKD and BD in dialysis. And finally, President Nangaku of JSN make closing remarks to young nephrologists. We hope that this symposium will lead to future and further collaboration among participants from both societies. Now, let us move on to the message from representative of the two societies. So I think that the Professor Hashihara, please. Okay, thank you very much, kind introduction, Motoko. Uh, dear colleagues and friends, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the third joint meeting organized by Young Nephrologist Platform of IRA yeah. and JSN. Uh, despite the virtual setting, I'm truly excited about the opportunity for us to come together and exchange knowledge and our insights. So be before we begin, uh, I want to express my sincerest gratitude to two uh, key leaders who have made this program possible. A special thanks to Professor Onsoya uh, Chebrekar, a chair of Young Nephrologist Platform Yira, and Motoko Yanagita from JSN for their leadership. Of course, uh, Professor Christoph Banner, a president of Yira, uh, Professor Masaomi Nanda, president of JSN and ASN and the Professor Rosa Tora, President-elect of e ERA, uh, for their invaluable contributions and support. Uh, to the young scientists joining us today, uh, we recognize the vital role you play in shaping the future of uh, nephrology. So your passion, dedication, and the innovative spirits are essential in driving progress in our field. As you embark uh, on your journey as scientists in this field, uh, remember that uh, you are not alone. Both uh, ERA and JSN are committed to providing you with uh, resources, mentorship, and opportunities for growth. So we believe in your potential to make meaningful, contrib meaningful contributions to nephrology and look forward to witnessing your great achievements. So this meeting highlights the importance of working together across borders to improve science. By joining forces, we can better tackle the challenges and opportunities facing our field. So this year, uh, we are going to address two important themes. One is ADPKD, another is dialysis practice. So as we start this journey together, uh, let's keep uh, an open mind and respect diverse viewpoints. By doing so, we can make uh, real progress in nephrology and beyond. So I want to thank uh, all the organizers, speakers, and the participants for their dedication to this event. So I'm sure our time together will be both enjoyable and uh, informative, uh, paving the way for more collaboration and success, success in nephrology. Uh, thank you very much. So uh, thank you. I think it's now my turn. 
um, Christoph Wanner. Uh, first of all, I thank for the kind introduction by our chairwomen. And um, this is the third year, the third meeting. And to me, it is more or less already a tradition. And I would like to thank the JSN leadership for uh, keeping us together and always organizing with us this nice uh, and fruitful meeting. So um, why are we like to do this? Uh, because YMP is the Young Nephrologist platform in Europe, and it was created to educate the younger generation, not only in English. Meanwhile, I see perfect communication but also to hold the academic idea, the academic thinking in our money earning hospital business. We need to keep the academic idea. And we all also want to encourage mentoring the elderly professors that they help the younger generation to achieve their goals. And, um, we would like to make the next generation also visible. For me today to see uh, Dr. Kurashige and Yamada, two representatives, uh, I learn names, I learn their topics, I can remind and remember. And this is very useful and you see also Europe. So uh, we want uh, the community uh, that the community is helping to strengthen the career of the young people by making you visible among the community. And I think we have today about over 200 who are interested in our symposium. Uh, your name is becoming visible and this helping the careers of everybody of the young generation. I, I like this meeting. I like uh, the Japanese Society of Nephrology. I am coming every year to the meeting this year, June as well, because I'm learning always something about the different culture. And also it's a different language, but there's enough to observe and, and to see over in Japan and to learn. So I thank you again, the JSN for uh, creating, for having this meeting, having ERA here in this meeting. And um, I hand over to the chairs of the meeting. Thank you. So I am Kaori Hayashi from Keio University, and um, I will serve as a chair. And I'm very happy and honored to uh, participate in uh, this uh, very special meeting. Hi, all. Thanks, Dr. Hayashi. I am Shafak Miroğlu the ERA YMP chair elect from Turkey. I'm a nephrologist based in uh, Istanbul University. I'm happy to ha chair this uh, session uh, joined with the Japanese Society of Nephrology. Uh, we will gather the questions at the end of each part after two presentations and ask the uh, speakers and get their answers. Uh, so let's start with uh, Dr. Mahiro Kurashige from Japan. He uh, completed his education uh, at GK University School of Medicine in the early years of his career. And after that, uh, he took a hiatus to um, do a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Institutes of Health in the United States. And he's currently an assistant professor in the GK University School of Medicine. And He's going to talk about genetic diagnosis and treatment of ADPKD in Japan. Dr. Kurashige. Good morning uh, and good, good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mahiro Kurashige from the GK University, uh, Tokyo, Japan. Uh, I'm very honored to have a great opportunity to participate in the third JSN and YNP era joint meeting. Uh, I would like to express my gratitude to Dr. Yanagita, Dr. Cheprek Hall, uh, President uh, Dr. Nangaku, President Dr. Warner, and Professor Kashihara, and Professor Tora, and everyone else uh, who organized the event. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to speak uh, on the topic of genetic diagnosis and treatment of ADPKD in Japan. I have not, nothing to declare any uh, COI here. 
uh, first of all, uh, so let me introduce uh, Tokyo area and my hospital concept. So this slide shows the uh, location of my hospital. The GK University Hospital is uh, one of the university hospital located on the south side of Tokyo, Japan. Tokyo uh, is a densely populated city that spreads out from the Imperial Palace with roughly uh, 10 million people residing in the urban area. As indicated uh, by the blue marker, uh, within the diameter of approximately 15 kilometers from central Tokyo, there are over 20 large-scale hospitals and medical centers covering a significant part of the patient population. Today, uh, I'm going to briefly discuss the theme of session one, which is ADPKD, uh, also more dominant for cystic kidney disease. Uh, ADPKD is one of the most common inherited kidney disease disorders. Epidemiological data in Japan uh, and data based on the imaging examination in health checkups shows a prevalence rate of approximately one in thousand to one in four thousand. Around half of individuals uh, develop ESRD end stage renal disease by their six decades, making ADPKD the fourth most common cause of ESRD. Genetically, the majority of cases involve mutations in either PKD1 or PKD2 genes. These are the diagnosis, the diagnostic criteria for ADPKD in Japan. In Europe and or United States, established diagnostic criteria by Professor Rabin or Professor Pei are highly recognized. The Japanese diagnostic criteria, which is proposed in the 1990s, based on those Professor Rabin criteria, but uh, it it is still used today. A definitive diagnosis requires the presence of five or more cysts in each kidney. In addition, a typical ADPKD like cystic diseases should be excluded. Here, uh, I'm presenting imaging showing bilateral and multiple cystic kidney. So let me ask you a quick question. Among these, which one do you think is ADPKD or not ADPKD? Actually, none of them are typical cases of ADPKD. It's not straightforward to diagnose ADPKD based just on the number of cysts or inheritance. So these kidney have multiple cysts of some of them showed autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. Therefore, genetic molecular testing should be considered essential for diagnosis. Here, uh, I'm going to talk about the re real aspect of molecular diagnosis in Japan. Currently, genetic testing is not common in clinical practice in Japan. There are several reasons for this. The most significant uh, issue is the lack of optional insurance of, or public coverage for the high cost. Due to this, genetic testing is not yet recommended in guidelines. However, it is conducted exclusively for research purposes. Here, uh, I would like to present specific case of ADPKD. Uh, let's start with the two cases on the left. The first case is 39-year-old male with a large TKV and a PKD1 truncated variant. Uh, despite his young age, he required dialysis initiation. The second case is a 30-year-old male uh, with a PKD1 truncated variant who started dialysis at the age of 21. Next, so let's look at the two cases on the right. Both are female patients with PKD2 mutation. 
in an 85-year-old female patient, renal function remains almost normal. And in a 78-year-old female patient, serum creatinine level shows very mild disease. These examples demonstrate that while <clears throat> uh, some patients with PKD uh, can live a, live a life uh, beyond the average lifespan without significant kidney complications, but some cases progress rapidly, leading to ESRD before the age of 40. According to the very common data from France, the median age of ESRD are variable by pathogenic variant. It is 79 years old for PKD2, 67 years for PKD1 non-truncated variants, and 55 years for PKD1 truncate variants. Therefore, early diagnosis, particularly for PKD1 truncated variants, should be crucial for early intervention and treatment. On the other hand, apart from PKD1 and PKD2 genotypes, the Mayo classification by Mayo Clinic reflects the severity of disease. This diagram plots TKV corrected for height on the vertical axis and patient age uh, on the horizontal axis to determine where the patient falls within the five quadrants, 1A to 1E. For instance, cases where the kidney volume is large relative to age are considered severe disease, while case, cases where the kidney volume does not increase significant, significantly with age are considered mild disease. We plotted the data from 243 ADPKD patients who attended our university hospital. With a median age of 47 years old and median total kidney volume of 1,041 milliliters, and most may patient fall within quadrant 1B and 1C and 1D. We highlighted uh, in, I'm sorry, we highlighted in red for those who pro progressed to ESRD uh, within five years of the examination. Although quadrant 1A and 1B are usually considered mild disease, we observed no ESRD patients in quadrant 1A, but some patient in quadrant 1B did develop ESRD. I believe that while the Mayo classification is very convenient and easy to understand, but it may not be universally effective in predicting disease progression. Next, I combine the Mayo classification plot with PKD genotype. It's not entirely definitive. Certain trends were observed. I used magenta for PKD1 truncated and orange for PKD1 non-truncated, light blue for PKD2 and gray for patients with no pathogenic variant found. What's interesting here is that PKD1 truncated magenta spans all five quadrants, 1A to 1E, and including uh, those classified as mild disease in quadrant uh, 1A and 1B. Additionally, uh, variants of uncertain significant BUS are predominantly present in 1A and 1B, suggesting that they look milder than PKD2 variants. BUS means that pathogenic variant could not be identified, but it might imply mild disease. In my opinion, in actual clinical practice, evaluating both the Mayo classification and genetic testing results should be beneficial.
Next, uh, I'm going to discuss preventive uh, therapeutic intervention for ADPKD. Unfortunately, due to lack of evidence, there are few evidence-based therapeutic options for ADPKD. Regarding diet, excessive salt intake has been shown to increase kidney cyst independently, irrespective of blood pressure. So, salt reduction guidance should be necessary. Although caloric restriction uh, and prescribed water intake were effective in experimental models, clinical trials have not shown positive results, so they are not recommended in gu guidelines. However, given that IBMI is associated with kidney volume in ADPKD, attention should be paid to calorie intake. Antihypertensive medications such as ACE inhibitors, ARVs, are recommended, and aggressive blood pressure control has been shown to be beneficial in preventing renal function decline, especially in younger patient with preserved renal, renal function. Tolvaptan is also recommended based on the result of large-scale studies. Tolvaptan, known as SAMSCA or GeneArc worldwide, is a medication used for ADPKD in many countries. It acts as antagonist to the vasopressin V2 receptor, inhibiting the downstream of cyclic AMP signaling, which in turn uh, suppresses uh, suppress mechanisms of cell proliferation and fluid secretion. Large-scale trials, such as TEMPO study and the Reprise study, have demonstrated its renal protective effect. Here, uh, I present a case where the introduction of tolvaptan successfully inhibited the growth, cyst growth. This case involved a woman in her 50s, and the MRI images of both kidney over time are shown here. In the left half of the screen, from 2013 to 2070, the annual growth rate was 6.4% 6 .6 per year. However, after introduction of tolvaptan, kidney volume enlargement stopped and has remained stable up to the present. Also, it may be difficult to compare the kidney appearance in these figures. This case involves PKD1 truncated variants, which typically shows rapid progression. Therefore, we believe that this case demonstrates the benefits of tolvaptan treatment. There are reports investigating whether there are any, any differences between races in tolvaptan treatment. So this is a subgroup analysis of the TEMPO study. If we look at uh, the TKB change rate, it was found that both in the placebo group and the tolvaptan group, the TKB growth rate was lower in Japanese group the reason for this result is unknown, but it is speculated that the smaller body weight or physique of East Asian races compared to Caucasians may have contributed to advantageous drug kinetics or pharmacodynamics. One of the most crucial factors in the continuous intake of tolvaptan for ADPKD is the financial cost. In Japan, 10 years have passed since this medication was released in 2014. Even with a dosage of 120 milligram, it uh, remains expensive, costing around uh, 300,000 yen or 1,800 uh, 1, uh, euro per month. There are no private or insurance products in Japan that cover chronic organ treatment for ADPKD, so patients must rely on the medical, medical expense subsidy system, financial, financial assistance, for specified interactive, interactable diseases. 
this system allowed them to reduce the cost of around 30,000 yen or 180 euros per month. To be eligible for this, TKB must be uh, 750 milliliter or more, and the annual TKB growth uh, must be 5% or higher. Here is a brief overview of the trends observed in patients undergoing tobaptan treatment at our hospital. There is a slightly higher proportion of male patients. And the most common renal function stage is CKD stage 3A. The age group most commonly affected in their, in their 40s to 50s, with the majority falling into the male classification category of 1C and 1B, which are considered moderate to moderately severe. To suppress ESRD, it is essential to use, uh, use tobaptan in early stage and younger CKD patient. However, younger patients tend to have less interest in treatment. So it's crucial to provide proactive explanations based on appropriate risk assessment. Similarly, I will present the effect of tobaptan or renal function here. We compare the EGFR decline before and after tobaptan treatment in cases where EGFR was followed for at least one year, both uh, before and after treatment. The annual EGFR decline before treatment was minus 3.19, uh, which improved to minus 2.15 after tobaptan treatment. However, when analyzed by gender, while there was significant improvement in EGF while decline in males, no significant difference was observed in females. In the graph on the right, the vertical axis rep represents the extent of improvement in EGF while decline after treatment. Arranged in order of effectiveness. Those in the 30% 30, 30 on the right side would be various, uh, would, uh, side would be classified as non-responders due to lack of improvement in EGFR, possibly due to various reasons. It is necessary to clarify who are responders and non-responders to Tobatan treatment in the future. In summary, to confirm a diagnosis of ADPKD, it's necessary to exclude PKD-related disorders, and genetic testing is highly useful for this purpose. However, in Japan, genetic testing is still in its early stage of dissemination. While Mayo classification is convenient and for determining disease severity, it's uncertain whether it reliably predicts ESRD. Tobaptan remains the only treatment with evidence, but further insights into responder and non-responders are necessary in the future. That's it. Thank you very much for attention and listening. Thank you very much for a nice presentation, Dr. Krasike. And um, Q&A will be uh, conducted at the end of this session collectively. So oh, uh, let's move on to the next presentation. Let me introduce the next next speaker, uh, Dr. Maria Vanessa Perez-Gomez um, from Clinical Trials and Inherited Kidney Disease Unit, Nephrology and Hypertension Department, Fundacion Simenes-DS University Hospital and Health Research Institute, Universidad Autonom Autonoma de Madrid, and the title is Genetic Diagnosis and Treatment of ADPKD in Europe. So, Maria, please start. Hi, Hi thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me here. Uh, can you hear me well and can you see my presentation? Yes. Perfect. Genetic Diagnosis and Treatment of ADPKD in Europe. These are my disclosure of interest. 
Autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, or ADPKD, is the most common inherited nephropathy and is the most frequent monogenic disease causing kidney failure. In this disease, there is an increase in total kidney volume and there are bilateral kidney cysts that are growing in a disorganized manner. The cause of this is a genetic defect in PKD1 and or PKD2 genes, which encode for the proteins polycystin 1 and polycystin 2, and they form the complex polycystin 1, 2. This complex is located in the primary cilia, and a defect in this uh, will produce decrease in intracellular calcium, which will consequently increase the cyclic AMP intracellular and this will produce mainly two harmful processes in the cell. First, induce signaling cell proliferation, and two, stimulate fluid secretion. The exaggerated cell proliferation and fluid secretion will increase the number and the volume of this cyst. This cyst will compress and deform the normal architecture of the kidney, of the kidneys, but, um, and then will produce progressive loss of functional nephrons and will uh, lead a uh, kidney failure. What about the ADPKD genetic test study in Europe? Most of the time genetic study is not necessary for diagnosis here. Uh, that means in the presence of a positive family history, classic ADPKD can, can be diagnosed using imaging criteria. Mm, normally or usually with an ultrasound is enough for the diagnosis. A genetic analysis may be considered here in some situations, for example, in very early onset or early onset of AKD, in absence of familiar history or a typical imaging presentation or diagnosis exclusion in, in individuals at risk of uh, progression or individuals, for example, uh, potential kidney donors can be at, at risk. Uh, it is important to consider that variants in other genes can also cause kidney disease. Variations in these genes associated with polycystin 1 and 2 saturation in the reticulum, uh, endoplasmic reticulum, has been described as a cause of renal cysts of kidney cysts, uh, and you can see the, the list here in the slide. What type of genetic test do we carry out here? Uh, the complexity of the genomic structure of PKD1 has long been a barrier to routine genetic testing in patients with, with ADPKD. However, innovations in genomic promise to make or promise to make genetic testing more accessible for the patient. Next generation sequencing panels to screen PKD1, PKD2, and other genes involved in cystic disease are the best cost-effective options, and the costs of these are likely to decrease soon because they are using in more labs. Although it is important to identify the genetic cause of the disease, we know that many other factors also can influence the progression until the, 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 the disease reaches kidney failure. For example, it's important to know that environmental factors will influence or diet or medications. So uh, the, the genetic mutation is not a factor that in isolation can mark the evolution of the patient. It's important, but we have to look other factors also. Uh, what about the ADPKD treatment in Europe? Multiple studies and randomized clinical trials has been ruled out in different pathways involved in the pathogenesis of ADPKD. However, at this time, tolbaptan is the only approved treatment for ADPKD. Tolbaptan is a, a vasopressin B2 receptor antagonist. By acting at this level, will uh, decrease the cyclic AMP, and this will decrease the cell proliferation and will decrease the, the fluid secretion that produce the, the, the problems in this disease. This, this was the first randomized clinical trial showing efficacy of tolbaptan in ADPKD patients. It was TEMPO 3.4. It was published in 2012. And in this trial, they include uh, adult patients up to 50 years old, and with glomerular filtration rate greater than 60. 
Uh, in this trial, less loss of kidney function in three years was observed in tolbaptan group compared to placebo. Thanks to Tempo 34, tolbaptan was approved in the European Union in 2015 with these indications. Adults with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, chronic kidney disease from G1 to G4, and whose disease is progressing rapidly. The problem is that the European Medical Association does not specify how to identify rapid progressors. Uh, and here, were, uh, here was where our problems began because we want to know how can we identify patients who will benefit the treatment from tolbaptan? And uh, for this reason, uh, in 2016 was published the first society-based recommendation statement for the use of tolbaptan in the European uh, Renal, uh, for the European Renal Association, the ERA. However, after this, some uh, some uh, nephrologists. Uh, began to notice that some patients at risk of progression were excluded from the treatment using this algorithm. For example, this is a talk by Bake in the ASN in 2018. He applied this algorithm to his cohort of ADKD patients where more than 470 patients and he notes that uh, more than 83 percent of the patients with high risk of progression were excluded from treatment. The reason of this uh, was the first era statement placed greater emphasis of mensurate rapid progression based on the historical decline in estimated glomerular filtration. But we know with the evolution of the disease the cis formation precedes the decline in estimated glomerular filtration rate. That means that ADPKD patients may be progressing rapidly in young patients despite a normal estimated glomerular filtration rate in this moment. So total kidney volume can predict this glomerular filtration rate drop. Of course, it is important the historical decline of uh, estimated glomerular filtration rate because if you are if you see the patient is losing glomerular filtration rate, you have an actual evidence of rapid progression, but you can't wait until this moment to start treating the patient. You can act before. We know that the standard model for predicting renal outcome is the major clinic imaging classification, which classify the patient in five groups. Uh, this um, classification relates the height, total kidney, the height adjusted total kidney volume with the patient A, and the, the, the first two uh, will, classify, will be classified as a flow progressor. The last two, 1D and 1E, will be rapid progressor, and 1C can be slow, can be rapid. It depends on other factors. Since the era position statement, considerable practical experience has been accumulated on the use of tolbaptan in ADPKD. For example, additional data for, from another randomized clinical trial, the reprise. Uh, this was published in 2017. Uh, um, they include patients with the glomerular filtration rate from 25 to 75 and with patients uh, up to 75 year old. In one year, they observed benefit of tolbaptan in advanced stage disease. In only one year, tolbaptan group has 35 uh, less drop of the glomerular filtration rate in 12 months. This is another interesting study um, published in 2018 is a retrospective analysis of 87 patients who have been treated with tolbaptan up to uh, for up to 11 years. He, here, com uh, the comparison of the predicted and the actual decrease of uh, glomerular filtration rate uh, show a reduction in kidney function loss. This is um, another important aspect we have learned: the sooner treatment is started, the more progression is delayed. 
And this is based on hypothetical high extrapolation based on randomized clinical trials results. And here you can see if you start the treatment in a, with aglomerular filtration rate around 60, you can delay the, the renal replacement therapy uh, for example, in, in almost seven years. But if you start a treatment uh, in around 30 per 30 remediation rate, you can delay it only two and a half years. So uh, uh, the sooner treatment is started, the more progression is delayed. After all this knowledge, it was clear that we needed a, an update of the recommendation. Some countries countries in the European Union decide to create their own algorithm. For example, in Spain, this is the, in Spain that where I participate. And there were too many, too many guides with a lot of variability. Here, six different guides were uh, compared. All of them uh, applied to the same um, cohort of patients, uh, 131 ADPKD patients. And you can see the different, uh, the highest patient number was selected by the Scottish guideline and the lowest by the Japanese approach. So um, as you can see, too many guides with a lot of variability. But finally, in 2022, we, we get the update of the guidelines for the ERA uh, uh, European Renal Association. And this is a new algorithm. The proposed new algorithm recommends the evaluation of patients with global filtration rate over 25 and with the age less than 55. The previous limits were 45 and 50 respectively. Then the guys say that until 40, 40 years, you, can not, you will not expect a loose of glomerular filtration rate, but after 40 years, you, you, you will expect uh, some loose of glomerular filtration rate if the patient is a rapid progress. After this first filter, you will look for the uh, rapid progression criteria. And you have two. First, you will look for the actual evidence of glomerular filtration rate loose. It, will, it will, was established in more than three millimeters per, per minute per year in the last four years. If you don't have this information of is inconclusive, you, you can look for the second one which is applied the uh, Mayo Clinic classification. Patients with uh, classif classified as 1C and 1D will meet the criteria for treatment. And if not, for example, if 1C, you, 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 you can uh, take together a combination of clinical imaging and genetic information to make the decision if the patient have or not um, um, treatment criteria or, or meet or not. And this is the uh, current uh, authorization or uh, indication for the 12 baptism treatment in Europe. Adult patients with autosomal dominant polycystic kidney disease, chronic kidney disease from G1 to G3 at initiation of treatment and with evidence of rapidly progressing disease. And this is the million dollar question. Has 12 baptism been effective in delaying the incidence of renal replacement therapy in Europe? The answers are uh, yes, of course, no at all. We will never know and we can find out. And the, the answer, the correct answer is the D, but how, how can we find out? The ERA registry collects data on renal replacement therapy in Europe. This collects data up to the last two years and classifies it by the primary cause of the chronic kidney disease and adjust it to age and sex. Uh, this information, information is accessible to the public. In this article published in 2014, these authors ask the same question, but with conventional treatment of uh, chronic kidney disease. And they wonder, has conventional treatment been effective in delaying the incidence of renal replacement therapy in Europe, in ADPK patients, of course, and they include a more, um, more than 20,000 ADPKD patients started renal replacement therapy in 12 European countries between 1991 and, 20, and 2010. And uh, they separate the, the, the time uh, in, in four different periods of time and separate the population in different group of age. And they conclude no change over time was found in the incidence of renal replacement therapy 
of ATPK ID up to age of 50, you can see here 50, whereas in recent period of time, the incident in patients above the age of 70 really increased, as you can see here. Uh, but may, maybe this the last is, is not for the conventional treatment, maybe it's because the elderly patient have more access to the dialysis, no? But we insist, we wrote a letter to the editor and we insist and say, look at more details. Maybe if you delete the, the first period of time, the, the last, the, the, the previous one, um, because my, less people have a, a, a access to dialysis or, or less data. And you can see uh, the orange one is the last one. You can see a tendency to down the, 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 the incidence of renal replacement therapy in the group over 50. In the group uh, up to 50, it's difficult to see uh, a difference because the, the, the disease has to be stable in this phase. But this is an interesting uh, um, exercise. Perhaps to answer our question about tolvaptan, we can do the same exercise. But we have to know that a COVID pandemic could be influenced the, the, the results. And of course, the database still has some bias. For example, there are different incidents per million population in different European countries. Countries, uh, as you can see here, there are a lot of variability. Uh, can be this due to underdiagnosis or the different availability to renal replacement therapy in different cons? Can be also another another bias can be that, that not all, all countries have always provided information. Here is color is a different country. And, and you can see uh, uh, in, the, in, the, in the last year, more, more countries have joined to the registry. But if we filter only the, the countries that have, um, have uh, provided information since the, only the last 10 years, we can see something interesting. First, until 2018, there is a tendency to increase the incidence, maybe because more patients have access to dialysis. But after that, after uh, 2018 and preceding the COVID pandemic, there seems to be a slight trend toward to decrease the renal replacement therapy incidence. But why after 2018, if the treatment was approved in 2015? Due to the restriction of patients uh, over 50 and with glomerular filtration rate first, um, lower than 45, we will not expect uh, some change before the 2018. But more time is necessary to elucidate if availability to treatment with solbaptan has changed the epidemiology of ADPKD in Europe. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ah. Gomez, for the great presentation. Thank so, you. Uh, and Dr. Kurashige for your presentation as well. Uh, we have two questions in the Q&A. So uh, I will ask these questions to both of you, uh, your views uh, from the uh, Japanese uh, practice and the European practice. Uh, one is about the, of course, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors in PKD and uh, metformin as well. You know, uh, we all know that metformin from the TAME PKD trial published uh, recently, uh, maybe a few years ago, but it's not in the practice. Maybe we can um, get your opinions on that. And of course, SGLT2 inhibitors, um, there are the data on SGLT2 inhibitors in PKD are very limited, but the off-label use is possible since the, uh, its effect on glomerular hemodynamics. Uh, so can we get the views uh, from both sides? I, I think that uh, there are no current evidence about the, the use of ISLG2 treatment in ADPKD. There is a phase two trial now, uh, uh, but we, we have to uh, wait for the, for the results. Uh, it, we can think uh, we, we, we can think the, 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 the inhibition of this can be harmful for the ADPKD patients in one way because it uh, can increase the vasopressin uh, is one of the th theories, but in another way can reduce the, the mitochondrial oxidation, so maybe have some uh, benefits. So we can say because 
we, we don't have evidence in patients, but we, we have to wait until the evidence. In some way, we can think it will, it will be a benefit. We, we will find a benefit, and, but in, in another way, we, we can think we, we, don't, we, we will not see a benefit. And your views on metformin? Metformin doesn't have uh, evidence neither. Uh, and there are other clinical trials in, with metformin, uh, uh, but they don't, uh, they, they doesn't see a, a evidence. So they, they doesn't see a benefit in, in this patient. So but metformin is more clear that 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 not work. <clears throat> Thanks, Maria. Uh, Dr. Kurashige? Uh, yes, uh, so based on, I, I agree with uh, um, Maria's opinion. Uh, so about SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, so um, so many pros and cons here. Uh, and so our concern is mainly to two concerns. Uh, so it is uh, like exposure to glucose-rich urine in proximal or distal tubule or collecting duct, or uh, so probably SGLT2 inhibitor upregulate, upregulate the HIF, hypoxia-induced factor. So that may or may not leading to assist expansion uh, in experimental model. So, so that's a concern. So, but, uh, so, you know, so there is not so many uh, evidence and trials here. So, and so just in the Japanese uh, Society of Nephrology, a part of a uh, meeting in the possessive kidney disease. Uh, so we are preparing the uh, clinical trials for ADPKD using uh, SGLT2 inhibitors. So uh, so we need some ans answers uh, for trials. And next, uh, metformin. So uh, I also I also think that way. So uh, there's so we we don't have uh, too much evidence uh, for SGLT. So in very limited, uh, short clinical trials, we have positive result, but uh, also we need um, much more evidence here. Okay, thank you. And the final question is about scleroterapy. Um, it's been asked that does scleroterapy for larger cysts, cysts uh, have any help to maintain kidney function? Uh, in these patients. We know that it can be used, especially after um, um, in the patients with uh, excruci excruciable pain or uh, with, uh, with very large cysts to um, uh, stop uh, developing uh, more fluid into them. But uh, I do not have any, uh, I do not recall any data on its positive effects on kidney function uh, in these patients, so what do you think, and do you have uh, any data on this? So in my case, uh, so uh, in my university hospitals, uh, so far, uh, I don't experience a uh, uh, patient uh, who need a scleral therapy for a uh, single giant uh, cyst. Uh, so maybe it it may be necessary for the uh, limited patient uh, who are uh, suffering from the. Uh, abdominal pain or some respiratory disorder uh, by the very giant cyst. So, but uh, in terms of uh, preventing ESRD or pre uh, preventing uh, renal dysfunction, uh, uh, I don't think it's necessary for the uh, scleral therapy. Yeah, I, I am agree. I am agree. It's, there are some specific indication as pain are or compress other organs, for example, but not for for prevent the the loss of the filtration rate. Yeah, I hmm. I completely agree with both of you. Um, Doctor Hayashi, do you have any question? Oh, thank you. Um. I have one question for uh, Dr. Maria, and you presented the criteria, unique criteria, uh, to whether the tolbaptan therapy is uh, um, should be used or not. And you uh, you presented uh, it is four years to evaluate the EGFR decline. Mm -hmm. Why 
why four years is necessary? I think this is a, a interesting topic. It is a difficult make a decision to make when you um, do a guide because uh, we know that estimated glomerular filtration rate have a lot of variability. Sometimes it not depends only on the uh, glomerular filtration rate, depends uh, of, of, of the kidney function, depends on other factors. So the creatinine can um, slow, uh, down or can increase with for, uh, due to other factors. So I think for this reason, it's important to see the, um, um, the last four, four years. And and with not, they say also at least five different determinations, not, not to, not, so you need a lot of determination to see this is a, a, a change because, because the, the variability of the female glomerular filtration rate change or is because the patient is losing glomerular filtration rate. So it's for this reason, because there are a lot of variability in this determination. It's not exact. And not only is, uh, uh, show the the, 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 the glomerular filtration rate, uh, mm -hmm. fu the function, the renal function. Hmm. Thank you. Thank you, you. So um, let's move on. Uh, thanks to my co-chair, uh, Dr. Hayashi, and uh, for the excellent presentations, Dr. Krashike and Dr. Perez Gomez. And let's move on to part two of our uh, seminar. Uh, part two will be on uh, dialysis, novelties in dialysis practice. And the first speaker is uh, Dr. Shinsuke Yamada from Japan. Uh, he completed his training period uh, at Kyushu University in Japan, also currently an associate professor at the same institution. Uh, he will be talking on uh, CKD and BD in dialysis. Dr. Yamada. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Professor Muriel Gu, uh, Shinsuke Yamada from Kyushu University in Japan. I'm delighted to address the esteemed audience who gathered at the JS and YNP joint meeting and extend my sincere appreciation uh, for this invaluable opportunity to discuss recent advancement in managing CKD and BD. Uh, so this slide presents my COI disclosure. And so in this brief lecture, uh, I divide my presentation in two parts. Uh, first, I provide uh, an overview of the current CKD and BD management. And following that, I introduce three randomized control trials on CKD and BD conducted in Japan in recent years. And after that, I discuss one basic study that investigated the impact of calcium protein particle adsorption come. And additionally, I touch on medications and that inhibits the transition from primary CPP to secondary CPP. So I uh, begin my presentation with a slide uh, illustrating the cause of death in CKD dialysis patient. As depicted here, the cardiovascular disease stands as the primary cause of death in CKD patient, followed by infection and malignancy. The prevalence of cardiovascular disease is notably high in CKD patients compared to the general population, with cardiovascular, uh, cardiovascular death accounting for approximately 40% of all facility, for fatalities. Therefore, preventing the progression of cardiovascular disease is crucial for extending the longevity of a CKD patient. And as you are aware, you are aware, the CKD MBD is a systemic disorder ca characterized by biochemical abnormalities, bone disease, and vascular calcification. And recent studies have shown that CKD MBD affect multiple organs and systems, including bone and parasitic glands. And the management of CKD MBD is critical uh, to reducing the death risk and upholding quality of life among the hemodiasis population. Uh, one of the significant complications in hemodiasis patients is cardiovascular calcification. And not only does cardiovascular calcification impede optimal treatment, but it also contributes to the cardiovascular events. Uh, the calcium protein particle is a nano-sized particle that is composed of calcium uh, sorry, uh, the basic study have revealed that vascular calcification is a tightly regulated cellular process 
with uh, various mechanisms implicated. And these mechanisms include trans differentiation of vascular smooth muscle cells, apoptosis of vascular smooth muscle cell, cell resenescence, and mitochondrial dysfunction, and other mechanisms, and, include, uh, and also uh, calcium protein particle formation. And among these mechanisms, CPP is gathering increasing attention. The calcium protein particle is a nano-sized particle that is composed of calcium, phosphate, vitamin A, and other serum proteins. And this uh, CPP system is to prevent the precipitation of calcium phosphate crystal by the colloid formation and serves as a mineral chaperone. And there are two types of calcium protein particle, the primary CPP and the secondary CPP. And the primary CPP plays a physiological role in transporting calcium phosphate to other parts of the body, whereas CPP2 is now regarded as more toxic and more inflammatogenic than CPP1, and is considered to play a central role in the pathogenesis of vascular calcification. And CKD patients often have a large amount of calcium phosphate loading, circulating fetching A levels are decreased, and the formation of CPP is considered to be increased in the circulation and tissue. So the prevention of CPP formation and transition to CPP2 is clinically important for the prevention of cardiovascular calcification. As illustrated here, the in vitro study have demonstrated that synthesized secondary CPP induced calcification of the extracellular matrix of the cultured vascular muscle cells and result in cell death, whereas primary CPP did not elicit these effects. So these findings strongly suggest that pathological role of secondary CPP in the pathogenesis of cardiovascular calcification. And among a variety of risk factors, as phosphate loading emerged as a significant driver of vascular calcification. I will now introduce a recently conducted uh, RCT in Japan. The name is episode study. And this RCT uh, uh, randomized patient into two groups. So uh, one with a strict phosphate control group and a uh, standard phosphate control group. And uh, they also examined the changes in the coronary artery calcification and found that the strict phosphate control slows the progression of coronary artery calcification scores. So these results indicate that rigorous phosphate control has the potential to prevent the advancement of cardiovascular calcification. And managing phosphate level may impact outcomes for patients undergoing hemodiasis. And the calcium carbonate is shown to accelerate vascular calcification and is now less frequently prescribed in Japan. Uh, this, random, this randomized control trial, named the Landmark Study, it aimed to investigate the potential harm of calcium carbonate in hemodialysis patient. And the patient or device assigned to either calcium carbonate group or lanthanum carbonate group, and uh, followed up to approximately three years. And, and, and importantly, uh, there was no significant difference in terms of the primary composite outcome and all cause death. Uh, there are several uh, factors that may account for these findings. And firstly, the rate of cardiovascular events were comparatively low than those reported in other countries. And secondly, the dietary calcium intake was lower in Japan and thirdly, the median dose of calcium carbonate administered was uh, 1,500 to 2,200 milligram per day, uh, relatively lower than in other studies. So these results collectively suggest that a calcium carbonate may remain a viable option for Japanese patients as long as the maximum dose uh, does not exceed 2,000 milligram per day. And T50 is a novel marker that indicates blood calcification propensity. Uh, that indicates the time it takes for 50% of CPP1 uh, to uh, convert into CPP2. Uh, this measure is determined by using patient blood and calcification solution. 
and the nephrometry assesses the turbidity of a patient blood by detecting light scattering. And the individual with a shorter T50 are at a higher risk of developing cardiovascular calcification compared uh, with a longer T50. And cross-sectional study reveals that patients with hypercalcemia, hyperphosphatemia, and low serum fetuin A level are likely to have a, a shorter T50 and are likely to develop vascular calcifications. And the T50 measure is increasingly utilized in the preliminary studies. So uh, the victory study, which used the T50, is the uh, randomized control trial uh, that compared the etelcalcitide, which is calcium mimetics, and maxocalcitol, which is vitamin D receptor activator in hemodialysis patients with secondary hyperparathyroidism. Uh, patients were randomly divide, uh, allocated to either of the treatment and measures, uh, T50 was measured over a 12 month period. At the end of the study, the T50 value significantly increased in the etelcalcitide group compared with the maxocalcitol group. Because vitamin D receptor activator increased calcium phosphate absorption from the intestine, or increased calcium phosphate loading may cause cardiovascular calcification in the maxocalcitol group. So these results suggest that calcium mimetics may be a better option to control secondary hyperparathyroidism. So in Japan, the target ranges for serum MBD markers are originally derived from observational study of Japanese hemodialysis patients. As you can see here, the current guideline recommend maintaining serum phosphate level between 3.5 to 6 mg per dl, and for calcium, 8.4 uh, to 10 mg per dl. And notably, the CKD MBD guideline in Japan is undergoing a revision and in the updated guideline, based, upon, based on the episode study and other observational data, the upper limit uh, for phosphate is expected to be lower to 5.5 milligram per dl. So let's move on. Let's move on to the next part, and I will introduce some new treatment to reduce CPP-mediated cardiovascular toxicity. So the first one is CPP adsorption column. And the second one is a drug that prevents CPP maturation. So this paper is published in Scientific Report. And this basic study from Japan is based upon the previous study that alendronate, a bisphosphate, can effectively absorb secondary CPPs. The researchers prepared miniature pigs, removed both kidneys, and put them on hemodialysis treatment. And the miniature pigs were divided into two groups, so the control column group and a lanternate install column group. And uh, they were observed for 28 days. So when miniature pigs were treated with hemodialysis and one of the two columns, the CPP uh, concentration in the blood obtained from the outlet was significantly reduced in a lanternate uh, installed column group. And also the CPP concentration in the blood collected, collected from the outlet circuit during the hemodialysis session decreased after hemodialysis therapy. And importantly, uh, when miniature pigs were treated with the alendronate column, the mortality rate was significantly reduced. So why was the mortality changed by the CPP adsorption column? One reason may be the prevention of CPP-mediated vascular calcification. The magnitude of the calcification in the coronary artery was assessed in the following four scales. And when miniature pigs were treated with a alendronate-based column, the degree of coronary artery calcification was significantly reduced. And the next, when lung calcification, uh, which is another uh, ectopic calcification, and also uh, left ventricular hypertrophy were examined, uh, they were also reduced by CPP or adsorption column groups, as you can see here, 
And also the left ventricular mass index was significantly lower in, in, in pigs treated with alendronate group. And finally, the coronary artery rings were excited from uh, both groups and on examination of bradykinin induced endothelial dysfunction. As you can see here, the significant improvement was observed in the groups treated with uh, CPP adsorption column. And another promising approach to prevent cardiovascular calcification is the administration of uh, that of drives capable of inhibiting the maturation or phase transition of a calcium protein particle. So one of the drugs is SNF472, uh, which is a derivative of phosphate found in plants and exert strong chelating effects on calcium minerals. So uh, SNF472, uh, uh, this is a phase two trial named Calypso trial. As you can see here, the SNF472 reduced coronary artery calcification compared to placebo growth. And also a aortic bowel calcification was significantly decreased in patients treated with this SNF472. So currently, a more potent inhibitor is under investigation. So these results indicate the potential for these drugs to serve as promising treatment option for CKD hemodialysis patient in the future. And uh, let me summarize the potential strategy to prevent a CPP-induced vascular calcification. Because secondary CPP is a direct driver of vascular calcification, unloading of calcium phosphate by phosphate binders may be effective approach. And the calcium emetics can also lower serum calcium phosphate concentration by inhibiting calcium phosphate release from bone. And another approach may be blocking the phase transition of CPP by SNF472 and ISN301, which are not commercially available at this point. And in the future, the CPP adsorption column may be applicable to un patient undergoing hemodiasis. I did not mention in my talk today, but Pechuin A uh, which is synthesized in the liver and inhibited by inflammation uh, may be an important uh, calcification inhibitor. So uh, uh, maintaining serum fetching level, uh, we should avoid persistent inflammation and maintain good nutritional status may be important for the prevention of cardiovascular calcification. So uh, this is the summary slide of my talk today. So vascular and valvular calcification are life-threatening complication mediated by a variety of factors, including CKD and BD. And higher serum levels of calcium phosphate are the main drivers of cardiovascular calcification. So controlling serum MBD parameters in the recommended ranges by phosphate binders and calcimetics may be effective uh, uh, to uh, maintain a serum calcium phosphate level within the target range. And the CPP adsorption column may be a promising therapeutic option for hemodiasis patient. So in closing, I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to my coworkers and mentors, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much for a nice presentation, Dr. Yamada. Thank you very much. So let's move on to the, on to the next presentation. Um, the next presentation is by Dr. Luciano Perella um, from Department of Nephrology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Porto. Dr. Perella, please. Oh, hello to everyone. First of all, I would like to compliment all the participants in this virtual meeting and thank the Young Nephrologist Platform for the invitation and for having me here to discuss the renal osteodystrophy in peritoneal dialysis patients. I have no disclosure of interest relevant to this meeting. As we know, chronic kidney disease, mineral and bone disorder is a systemic disorder due to CKD that includes laboratory and bone abnormalities and vascular calcification. They are related to each other and associated with fractures, cardiovascular disease, and all-cause mortality. 
the renal osteodystrophy is the alteration of bone morphology that is best evaluated, as we will see, by a bone biopsy. With the worsening kidney function, there is a positive phosphate balance, which leads to an increased secretion of PTH and FGF23. In order to increase phosphate urinary excretion and maintain normal phosphate levels. However, this leads also to an inhibition of 1 alpha hydroxylase, enzyme that converts 25 OD vitamin D in calcitriol, and low levels of calcitriol contributes to the secondary hyperparathyroidism directly and indirectly. Directly because calcitriol coffee trial inhibits PTH secretion and indirectly because of hypocalcemia. So, positive phosphate balance and later hyperphosphatemia, hypocalcemia and low levels of calcitriol all stimulate parathyroid gland to release PTH and high levels of PTH leads to high turnover bone disease, contributes to vascular calcification and if left untreated, le leads to the hyperplasia of parathyroid gland and ultimately the therapeutic resistance and the need of parathyroidectomy. But bone disease in CKD is more complex than high levels of PTH leads to a high turnover bone disease because there are other factors such as remic toxins, sclerostin, that can lower the turnover. Also, there are factors that can impair mineralization. So, in order to best evaluate renal osteodystrophy, we have this TMV classification. When we perform a bone biopsy, we have several bone histomorphometric parameters that we can evaluate. But the most important one are those that we use in this classification, namely the bone formation rate to evaluate turnover, the mineralization, the leg time to evaluate mineralization, and trabecular bone volume to evaluate volume. And then within the low turnover categories of renal osteodystrophy, we have a dynamic bone and osteomalacia, depending if mineralization is normal or abnormal, respectively. And within the high turnover categories, the osteitis fibrosa, the classic lesion associated to hyperparathyroidism and uremic mixed osteopathy, depending if the mineralization is normal or abnormal. Few studies evaluate renal osteodystrophy in peritoneal dialysis patients using bone biopsy data. Uh, most studies are old with a varying number of patients, varying concentrations of calcium in dialysate, some of them with problems in classification, and then the, re the results are inconsistent. In the most studies, a dynamic bone is the most frequent pattern in peritoneal dialysis patients. However, the only study that patients were treated with lower dialysate calcium concentration, the high turnover lesions were the most frequent pattern and also in also in, in the Brazilian study, the non-diabetic patients had high turnover lesions instead of a dynamic bone. Indeed, the calcium concentration in dialysate may influence the bone histology in these patients. Here we have the results of a randomized clinical trials, including peritoneal dialysis patients with a dynamic bone proved by bone biopsy that were randomized to continue to be treated with a standard uh, calcium uh, 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 calcium concentration in dialysate of 1.6 millimol per liter or to be treated with a lower calcium concentration. Then, six is months, 16 months after randomization, a second bone biopsy was performed. As we can see, PTH levels were not different um, at the end of the study in patients treated with control with standard calcium, 
but there was increased PTH levels in patients treated with low calcium. Also, bone formation rate did not change significantly in patients treated with controlled calcium, but normalized in patients with low calcium concentration in dialysate. Accordingly, in the low calcium group, there was changed, five patients changed its bone histology from a dynamic bone to other forms of renal osteodystrophy. So let's summarize before we can move on. Most studies in this field are old, some of them with small number of patients. Only one study published after the 2009 KDGO guidelines that gave us different targets for PTH levels in dialysis. It remains to be clarified if non-diabetic patients and patients treated with lower calcium concentration in dialysis have high turnover lesions instead of a dynamic bone. And finally, the uh, association between vascular calcification and bone disease is not uh, re reported in this patient at a consistent manner. So to characterize renal osteodystrophy in equivalent peritoneal dialysis patients and study the potential role of several biomarkers in discriminating between renal osteodystrophy patterns, we performed a tetracycline labeled bone biopsy study with histomorphometric analysis according to KDGO. We included adult patients at least three months on our program, on peritoneal dialysis program, and excluded patients previously treated with hemodialysis, with history of parathyroidectomy, kidney transplantation, and treatment, and treatment with drugs that can interfere in bone metabolism. Also, in our program, all patients were treated with biocompatible PD solutions with calcium concentration of 1.25 millimol per liter. Also, to study the relationship between vascular calcification and bone disease and the potential role of several biomarkers in discriminating between the presence and absence of vascular calcification in the same cohort of patients submitted to the bone biopsy, the patients performed hands and pelvis x-ray to evaluate vascular calcification. We published our results in Journal of Bone and Mineral Research of our 49 peritoneal dialysis patients with a mean age of 53 years, half male, 20% diabetics, uh, majority in manual PD with calcium, phosphate, and PTH levels within the recommended target. At the left, we see the results of the entire cohort and we can see that a dynamic bone was the most frequent form of renal osteodystrophy occurring in 43% of our patients, followed by osteitis fibrosa and then normal bone. At the right, we see the results of patients with PTH between 150 and 600, roughly the recommended target. And we can see that the proportion of patients of a dynamic bone increased and the patients with normal bone decreased. In this slide, we see the relationship between PTH in the x-axis and bone formation rate in the y-axis. And we see that the, although it is a significant correlation, is only moderate, similar to other studies. Also, we see those these two vertical lines that represent targets for PTH, and these two vertic two horizontal lines. Those horizontal lines represent what was considered to be normal bone formation rate. And, for example, a patient with 600 PTH may have low bone turnover, normal bone turnover, or high bone turnover. Also, when we look at the patients with PTH within the recommended target guidelines, we see that the majority has low bone turnover. Our rock curve analysis 
of serum markers of low bone turnover show that the best isolated marker of low bone turnover was sclerosing. And in the high turnover, the best isolated marker was PTH. Our rock tables and the mathematical ratio between sclerosing and intact PTH increased the area under curve and added value in the diagnosis of low bone turnover with promising sensitivity and specificity. Uh, we also published the results of vascular calcification in nephrologia. 28% uh, of our patients had vascular calcification on x-ray, and when we compare the patients with or without vascular calcification, the patients with vascular calcification were older, with lower KT under V, all diabetic patients had vascular calcification, and also calcified patients had higher erythrocyte sedimentation rate. There was no difference between histomorphometric parameters in patients with or without vascular calcification, namely there was no difference in parameters related to bone turnover, bone mineralization, and bone volume. Our rock curve analysis showed that the best marker for vascular calcification was sedimentation rate. Indeed, in multivariate logistic regression analysis, only sedimentation rate remained statistically significant. So, we published the largest recent series of peritoneal dialysis patients submitted to a bone biopsy, and a dynamic bone was the most frequent pattern of renal osteodystrophy occurring in patients with a median impact parathormone level around 300, even in patients treated with a calcium dialysate of 1.25 millimol per liter. Also, sclerostin impact PTH ratio had the best performance in the diagnosis of a dynamic bone. This is a novel finding and surely deserves further study. Also, we report the relationship between vascular calcification and bone disease, and in our cohort, uh, it there was no association between vascular calcification and bone volume and bone turnover. This is contrary to the, what is reported to the hemodialysis patients. So, so in peritoneal dialysis patients, bone vascular axis may be a less relevant predisposing or causal factor, and maybe inflammation plays a more relevant role. So in conclusion, we think that there is a need to discuss PTH target range for peritoneal dialysis patients. Sclerostin should be further studied as a potential marker of a dynamic bone, and inflammation may be the, a, a very relevant factor associated to vascular calcification in peritoneal dialysis patients. So, Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for a nice and clear and understandable presentation. So we have four questions in Q&A box. And first is why there, why, um, there is no significant differences between calcium and no calcium binders regarding calcification and cardiovascular disease. So, um, Dr. Yamada, please mm -hmm. answer this question. Okay, thank you very much for the very important question. Actually, in, in the trial, uh, the cardiovascular event rate was very low uh, compared to the other studies conducted in other countries. So one of the reasons is the low cardiovascular event rate. And, and as mentioned in my talk, uh, the second uh, reason may be uh, because the Japanese patients uh, take less uh, calcium-containing foods, such as dairy, so the calcium loading was less compared to other patient, uh, other study patient and other studied. And the third one is, as I mentioned in my talk, uh, the calcium carbonate dose was relatively lower compared to other studies, so that's that's that. Those three uh, reasons maybe uh, explain why the 
uh, there is no significant difference between calcium-based phosphate binders and random carbonate. Thank you very much for a very mm -hmm. clear answer. And the next question is, how about the effect of studgins or PCSK9 inhibitors on vascular calcification? So uh, can I answer this question? Yes, please. Okay, so yeah, this is also a very important question. Actually, uh, when we uh, consider the pathogenesis of cardiovascular calcification, because uh, intimal calcification is related to atherosclerosis and repeat metabolism is very important uh, when we want to prevent uh, atherosclerotic disease. But as for medial calcification, uh, repeat metabolism is less uh, important uh, according to the previous study. So it's still uh, uh, is a, uh, unclear, I mean, unanswered que question, but a recent paper uh, which is published in CJSON two years late, two years ago, uh, when phosphate, uh, sedum phosphate or control in a very low range, the statin actually uh, reduced the cardiovascular calcification. So that was a, a pooled analysis of 40 trials or uh, trials that uh, determined the impact of statin on uh, cardiovascular disease undergoing hemodialysis patient. So um, it is possible that serum phosphate level may be or are, I mean, the uh, factor that uh, determines the impact of statin on cardiovascular calcification. But I'm, at this point, I'm not sure if uh, PCSK inhibitors or statin actually has some impact on the calcification. Thank you very much. Um, Dr. Perela, any additional comments in um, no, especially uh, I, in the I think the two previous answers um, were very clear. I have nothing to, to add. I think I can help in the following first question. Thank you. So the next question is can a parathyroidectomy in early stage for second hyperthyroidism? Parathyroidism uh, is uh, maybe effect for avoiding for CKD, MBD. So, Dr. Mm -hmm. Yamada, please. Okay. So, this is also a very important question. So, we have two options for secondary hyperparathyroidism. So, the surgical parathyroidectomy and a calcium metrics. And our treatment for secondary hyperparathyroidism actually prevent the progression of CKD MBD, but it is unknown whether early intervention to our secondary hyperparathyroidism by surgical parathyroidectomy is still unknown. But our one observational study from Japan shows that our parathyroidectomy actually improves the prognosis of hemodialysis patient. And after the parathyroidectomy, though the serum pH level is very low, but they don't, do, not all the patients develop a low bone turnover. So it is still early to conclude that early intervention for, sec, for uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism by a surgical parathyroidectomy is effective. But as long as, actually in Japan, do not, not many patients want to receive surgical parathyroidectomy. So uh, many patients want to take oral or intravenous calcimetic treatment. So actually, in my opinion, at this point, we don't have no evidence to, to intervene uh, secondary hyperparathyroidism in an early stage by a surgical parathyroidectomy. Thank you. Dr. Palato, any additional comment in your country about uh, an early stage of parathyroidectomy? Thank you for the question. I, I say that we, at the early age, at the early stage of secondary hyperparathyroidism, we should focus on the factors that can stimulate parathyroid gland to secrete the PTH. The factors that we discussed, such as positive phosphate balance, such as hypocalcemia, such as vitamin D deficiency, and 
even when the controlling these factors is not enough, today we have more and more drugs to tackle in the problem. We have active vitamin D, we have calcium emetics, and in our country, since the availability of ethylcalcetide, the number of parathyroidectomy decreased. So it, we should reserve, the, in my opinion, parathyroidectomy uh, until more uh, definitive evidence is coming. We should reserve parathyroidectomy for the patient with a severe hyper parathyroidism, severe secondary hyperparathyroidism that does not respond to the other treatments that I mentioned. Uh, it's our it's our way to do the things here and I think that is also in the uh, entire rest of the world too. <laughs> Thank you very much. So let's move on to the next question. And can alkaline phosphate level reflect bone turnover conditions? So, Dr. Pereira, please. Thank you for the question. Yes, the answer is yes. Uh, I did not mention because of the time, but in our study, uh, we not only evaluate PTH and sclerotin, but also ranclygon, osteoprotegerin, uh, and also alkaline phosphatase. In our study, we performed alkaline total alkaline phosphatase, excluding patients with hepatic problems and not bone-specific alkaline phosphatase, but even so, the uh, total alkaline phosphatase levels were a good predictor of bone turnover and a good predictor of low bone turnover, high bone turnover, not as good as sclerotin in low bone turnover and not as good as PTH in high turnover, but they were, uh, um, they were a sensible way and also is a sheep analysis. So if the price is a question, it's a, it's, a, it's a very good way to evaluate bone turnover. If we use bone-specific alkaline phosphatase or total specific or total alkaline phosphatase, but excluding patients with hepatic, hepatic disease. Also, um, in other studies, in other contexts, even in hemodialysis uh, patients, bone alkaline phosphatase has been proven to be a good marker of, of bone turnover. Thank you. And that is the last question. Are there any difference in bone density in APD or CAPD according to the PD modalities? And um, thank you. It is a great question. But the answer is no. We we performed that analysis. The data is not uh, shown here and did not publish because there was no difference. No difference in bone turnover, no difference in bone mineralization, no difference in bone volume. Um, in our uh, today in our PD program, we have half half patients with an automatic and half met, half patients with manual. Uh, in at the time when we performed the study, the majority was in manual, but there was no difference. Also, there was no difference in vascular calcification in patients treated with manual PD or uh, or automatic. Um, but still, is is a good question uh, anyway. Thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Meleo, any additional questions and comments? Um, thanks, Kauri. No, I do not have any questions at this point. And just want to thank Dr. Yamada, Dr. Pereira for their uh, great presentations. And uh, thank you for uh, gathering the questions and uh, closing this part as well. Uh, it's time to move on to closing remarks. Um, uh, I want to give the word to uh, Professor Masami Nangaku and Professor Rosa Tora uh, for this part. Professor Nangaku is the president of the Japanese Society of Nephrology and uh, professor and head of the Division of Nephrology and Endocrinology uh, from the University of Tokyo. And Professor Tora is the president-elect of the European Renal Association and, of, uh, and also chair of the Inherited Kidney Diseases Unit of the Department of Nephrology at uh, Universidad Autonoma de Barcelona. Uh, thank you, Safak, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Rosa Tora, uh, Professor Cristofana, and the leaders of the ERA uh, for uh, giving us the important opportunity to have this joint uh, symposium. I also want to thank uh, Professor Motoko Yanakita and Professor Naoki Kashihara 
for their uncanny leadership at the JSN side. I also want to thank speakers, moderators, and attendees. And last but not least, I want to thank uh, Paulina uh, Petinelli, Young Nephrologist Platform Coordinator, uh, who made a great contribution to this uh, symposium. I am very impressed with the high quality science presented here and hot discussion during the sessions. Young nephrologists are embarking on an incredible journey, one filled with discovery, innovation, and endless possibilities. Their contributions have the power to shape the future and make a future where all people have equitable access to sustainable kidney health. The cro to cross the boundary for innovation, collaboration between the two societies across the globe is very important. I wish further success of this Young Nephrologist platform, and I look forward to seeing each of you at the ERA meeting in Sweden this May and at the joint meeting in Kyoto in September. Thank you very much. And I want to ask uh, Professor uh, Rosa Tora to give the concluding remark. Thank you very much. Uh, as you see, I don't have such a beautiful background as Professor Naroke has. Um, well, I want to thank you really to the speakers and chairs for this excellent meeting. Uh, also to our staff and, and Japanese one to support this. But above, above all, a uh, heartful thanks to the young nephrologists for your unwavering commitment and active uh, participation. Uh, you truly represent the future of nephrology and we are very proud of you. Nowadays, the world of nephrology and the world in general are becoming increasingly global. Both uh, European and, 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 and Japanese nephrologists stand at the pinnacle. And gatherings like this are incredibly inspiring and educational, showcasing diverse approaches to tackling the same diseases. I am particularly delighted that this session focused on ADPKD, which happens to be one of my favorite topics. The new KD group guidelines will be released shortly. And I suggest you to revisit this topic in a couple of years and assess the implementation of these guidelines in our respective regions. Once again, thank you very much. Keep up the fantastic work and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Nangaku and Professor Tora uh, for these beautiful remarks. Uh, our session has come to an end, unfortunately. I want to thank all the participants, all the uh, people who were uh, watching uh, this webinar. And of course, uh, starting with Professor uh, Van Er and Professor Tora, Professor uh, Nangaku. I also want to uh, thank all of the speakers and my co-chair, Kaori Hayashi here. Thanks, everyone.